You are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. I'm here with Doug Casey. Doug, I know you're somewhere around the world, probably in South America. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell everyone about what it is that you do? Well, I guess I would call myself a a speculator by trade in terms of income that I've made. I probably am best known as a writer of books. Uh, My first book was a book called The International Man, which was published in 1976 uh, when the world was a very different place. And um, it sold many, many copies all around the world, actually. And um, it was the largest selling book in the history of Rhodesia, which is a record that will never be broken for obvious reasons. (laughs) And uh, my second book was a book called Crisis Investing. Uh, Mm. It came out in 1979. And it uh, talked about why the world was on the edge of uh, a global depression. And uh, what happened from 80 to 82 is that the world almost did go over the edge. Right. But uh, it recovered partially due to high interest rates. And then my third book was Strategic Investing. It came out at the end of 82. It was a stock market book, which basically was centered around how cheap stocks were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my best book was uh, foolishly titled Crisis Investing for the Rest of the 90s, but publishers title books mostly. I recommend that one. And I've had a couple of others uh, called Totally Incorrect and uh, Right on the Money that are out now. But I'm kind of leaving the, uh, the nonfiction space and I'm currently doing a sextet of novels to reform six unjustly besmirched and politically incorrect occupations. So that's who I am. I have a publishing company called Casey Research, and we have three free blogs and six paid newsletters, I believe. Or No, 12 paid newsletters. I'm sorry. Wow, that's excellent. I, I want to address this is that in uh, I'm talking to you and you're using this fantastic avatar of uh, one of my favorite graphic novels, um, V for Vendetta, which is a graphic novel written by Alan Moore, which has yes. some very fascinating philosophies. I, I know last time I, I had a chance to speak to you for two seconds, I did compliment you on, on V. Um, maybe we can discuss about why you like that story or, or a little bit, and because and, you did mention you're heading into the nonfiction space. What, what do you think about this story and maybe Alan Moore a little bit? I think it's marvelous. I'm a big fan of Alan Moore and and his graphic novels. They're fantastic. And, uh, of course, uh, very much uh, V for Vendetta. I understand he's he's not crazy about the movie version of Correct. it. I, I like the movie version of it personally. But And, of course, I'm a big fan of Guy Fawkes, who's the only man that ever entered Parliament with honest intentions. Right. So... Uh, but I've uh, long been a, uh, an anarchist. In fact, I've been an anarchist since 1971. I don't believe that government as an institution serves a useful purpose. Mm. Which is very similar, right, to the concepts um, highlighted in, in V for Vendetta. Is, is that correct? Yes, very much. And I, V for Vendetta was a story with a, a happy ending. I'm not sure although uh, something like that's going to happen probably in many places around the world over the next generation. Uh, I'm not convinced that it'll have uh, as presumably a happy ending as V for Vendetta did. Mm. One of my favorite scenes in the movie and and in the book itself is actually they reference, um, V references his enjoyment for another movie, which is um, The Count of Monte Crisco. And I had a chance to watch that, and I always thought that that was a very good movie from a whole perspective on like self empowerment and, and spending time to 
uh, research and and I don't know if you had a chance to watch that movie, but it was a fantastic period of time when uh, the Count of uh, Monte Cristo himself is held in jail for about thirteen years, and he he learns how to become a, a better man. And as soon as he escapes out of jail, he runs into a predicament where he could be in trouble with a bunch of pirates surrounding him. But he finds ways constantly to add value to to individuals to basically free himself more actually it was very fascinating you're exactly right and the count of monte cristo is absolutely uh one of the most heroic uh characters in mm. all of fiction and i recommend everyone read the book and uh see the movie yeah i i really enjoyed like I don't know if in the original book they refer to the books that are being read at that time because I saw a copy of The Prince, Machiavelli, um, The Wealth of Nations, a few copies of the books. I don't know if that was intentional or not. And, you know, I can't recall from okay. the original novel whether they're actually there or not. Right. Uh, if I had the time and I'd like to take the time, I'd like to actually read the novel again because it's a – it's a work of cosmic genius. And as long as we're talking about movies, mm. I'll put my finger on another one that I'm sure. a huge fan of, and that's uh, The Matrix. Ah, the, the, the crazy, everything's potentially an illusion um, kind of movie, isn't it? Well, it appealed to me because, um, of course, uh, I, I often describe myself, if asked to describe myself, as an anarchist atheist with... The solipsist tendencies. What, what so, is solipsis, uh, by the way? Excuse uh, solip- my simpleton understanding of the world, but well, solip- solipsism is a, uh, a philo- philosophical approach that, uh, and there are many variations of it. That, but it basically holds that the world is an illusion, mm. and it's all in your head. Nothing is real, and you create your own reality, or reality is the common creation of all of the people on the planet. Right. Uh, so that's, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's it in a nutshell. I think what one of the key things and maybe a very powerful aspect that, that the audience that's listening that can take away from this is almost the key message that you can be what you want to be. And as long as you can see it within the mind's eye, you can make your own reality. Um, I think that's a, a very important message, uh, very similar themes like in uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, you can do that. And understanding about, yes, the world is effectively um, your your playground. And um, just like your career path, Doug, you be effectively became a very renowned thought leader by using your understanding of, of many different views and putting that on text which is a very powerful thing. It almost transcends time to some extent, and and you now have all of this um, affiliated with you. This is a lot of the concepts that even Alan Moore discussed about. It, I, I mentioned this to Porter, because Porter's very good at providing copy, and I, I tell him that I think it's, it's very powerful. It, it leads to action, right? And the world that we live in right now, if you can develop ideas and concepts and you can put that and disseminate that throughout the media, um, it, you know, it, you can change your own reality to some extent. Yes, that's exactly right, Peter. And um, perhaps related to that uh, is the reason for many years I've been uh, counseling anybody that asks me about this subject uh, and, and telling them that unless you need to the formal discipline of a science or engineering mm. or you need a piece of paper in order to practice law or something like that you shouldn't go to college mm. in today's world it's a misallocation of at least four years of your time and a great deal of your money that you can do something much more intelligent with so um, this is part of what you were just saying about uh, creating your own reality and I don't believe in being processed in lockstep through uh, educational institutions, which are, uh, I think, counterproductive in today's world in many ways. Yeah, James Altucher seems to um, um, discuss a lot about that as well. I'm almost of the belief that 
I mean, if you, you sometimes never know how your children will turn out to be, because that's at the phase where they're going through that decision. Um, and, and I guess many people think that it is some form of hedge from all the rest of uncertainty to their child's uh, career trajectory to some extent as well. I, and I'm a big fan of Altichus. I think he's a very bright, very sound guy. I agree, and I agree with his um, with his thoughts on education. Absolutely, you, you uh, should be edu- you should be educating yourself as opposed to going to some very expensive and usually corrupt institution to be programmed. So yes, right, right. I always felt as if, um, and but Doug, the issue is that you don't know if all people have the same kind of skill sets to be like self motivated to to create their own reality. I don't know if that's the case for everyone, right? And and if you're not, then perhaps you're better off just going the conventional routes to some extent. Unfortunately, um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think the fact is is that. Uh, although everybody has a lot of unrealized potential, the fact is is that most people are uh, just robots and don't think about what they're doing in life. So, getting back to what James, what what Moore had in uh, I forget the Watchmen. Yes, everybody ought to try to become Doctor Manhattan. Mm. If you'll recall that, who actually becomes God at the end of the at the end of the novel. Not that I believe in God, but, you know, the concept, kind of. Yeah, I I think something analogous to that would be more about one of the interesting characteristics. I had a chance to speak to a physicist about this, is that in theology, it's all about uh, creating order where there's um, chaos to some extent, and and the ability to be, act as an architect for creating order, say, within your life, um, creating businesses which have order and structure around them, is, is definitely very admirable for an individual and part of creating their own reality. And, you know, it, I, one of the interesting things about Dr. Manhattan is he actually has the ability to use time as, well, he views time from all perspectives, the past, present, and future, actually. And if you understand how to use time as a form of leverage, you can tap into, or or what Isaac Newton says, which is stand on the shoulder of giants. You can use a lot of sound um, thoughts and ideas and people within the past to convey that in your present thoughts and after affect the future to some extent as well. So time is a big characteristic of Dr. Manhattan as well. Yes. Yep. So well, we're, that, uh, we're pretty much on the same wavelength, Peter. Well, this is fascinating. I, I, I never thought anyone else would discuss with me about graphic novels to this extent. Well, we could talk about the markets, but, you know, that's really just a matter of opinion. There's people that are it's going up, it's going down, they have uh-huh. reasons, but nobody knows. I can't predict the future from that point of view. So uh, talking, about, <laughs> talking, talking about philosophy is often, uh, in fact, it's always much more interesting and more valuable than, you know, just uh, uh, talking about, uh, trying to figure out which way the markets are going to go. I've got opinions on the markets too, but uh, uh, everybody's got one. So are they really worth listening to? I don't know. <laughs> I think some interesting things, it, this could be uh, philosophical to some extent, or um, it, it could be almost scientific to some extent, is I had a chance to speak to that, that physicist from Oxford, and we actually talk about the, the arrow of time and how a, a lot is actually predetermined. And when I tried to take that that perspective into markets. If you take a look at the way that people look at valuation and present value to some extent, we do do those those things in in capital markets, um, Doug, as in when developing models or order within the market, we actually think about like obviously the past, the present and the future and how it affects the value of a particular asset that we're observing. Yes. 
Yes, that's right. It, what about in terms of like your uh, school of thought for markets? I mean, there's many different ways to assess them. Sometimes it's connected to an economic paradigm as well. Um, what are your thoughts of, of ways in which people can rationally speculate? What, what tools are we needing to use for rational speculation? Well, from an economic point of view, I'm a member of the Austrian school and uh, that means, uh, among other things, that I'm very free market oriented. Mm -hmm. I said earlier when we, were, we first started talking that I don't believe that uh, government serves a useful purpose uh, in the world from either uh, an ethical or a practical point of view. Uh, I'm opposed to the uh, institution of the state on every basis. And uh, if, if we hadn't institutionalized the state the way it is since the Industrial Revolution. My, my view is that men would already be colonizing the outer planets of this solar system, and perhaps we'd be making our way to um, other stars in the galaxy because uh, the state has retarded human progress uh, immensely. So uh, that's the way I see things from uh, an econ economic point of view. But mm -hmm. since that's not the world we live in, uh, you're wise to use the distortions uh, and misallocations of capital that the state causes so that uh, you can profit from these things individually, uh, even while it's uh, destroying capital in general. Mm. I mean, it creates bubbles and uh, things like that that hopefully will uh, uh, allow you to do better than the average bear. So what, what tools does one use to explore these distortions or inefficiencies? Well, I'm a b believer, and going back to what we were talking about earlier about the Count of Monte Cristo, it's incumbent upon you to have as broad and deep a range of knowledge as you possibly can. In other words to not just know something about what you do for a living, but to know as much as possible about everything from ancient history to, to uh, uh, nuclear physics to uh, geography to geology, to, to try to have uh, knowledge about all aspects of human existence. Why? As far as the markets are concerned and investing. Uh, because... It's only with that knowledge that you have the perspective to make an intelligent decision and decide what to do, mm. uh, to tell whether something is cheap or dear and whether you should buy or sell. You know, I try to put that theory into practice, and it's not, not easy to put the theory into practice. Things are always only clear in retrospect, of course, but so that's... Uh, Doug, I'm, I'm, what would you say about a lot of intelligent people that are terrible speculators? Um, Isaac Newton comes to mind. You know, you can be extremely brilliant and knowledgeable, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good speculator. No, it doesn't. It's, it's, uh, a lot of it's a matter of psychology, mm -hmm. uh, which is the practical application of these things. I mean, this is one reason why I like to play poker, uh, frankly. Uh, you win or lose at poker, not so much based on the cards that you have, but based on the cards that other people think you have. Mm. Uh, you can win with absolutely nothing. So, uh, um, I, I think that's a good feature for poker. But I also think that an, another key factor to that is the, and this is that word, um, rational, because speculation is absolutely irrational too. But in poker, it's the probabilities behind the decisions as well that can be very interesting. I understand the concept of the bluff, but sometimes the concept of understanding what the other individual has from a probability perspective is a rational or objective to to some extent. And well, yeah, and what I was trying to indicate earlier when we were talking is there are oh goodness, there are probably a hundred countries in the world now that have stock markets of some type or another. And um, most people just watch the markets in their own country, and uh, it doesn't give them adequate perspective. 
Right. Uh, right. So I, I try to look at, at least out of the corner of my eye, at all markets everywhere. You know, not just stock markets, but bond markets and real estate markets and so forth. And there's no guarantee that you're going to come to the right conclusion from having all this knowledge, but it increases the odds in your favor of doing the right thing. So uh, I think well, maybe that clarifies it a little bit. I don't know. What, what interesting perspective on uh, diversification is um, there was a period of time, and irrationally, once again, one can just assume that means suddenly, oh, you need to be thinking about other countries. But um, our benchmark is actually the MSCI World Index, Doug. And what we do is we actually divide multinationals by sector. So the decision of what is the best to breed within the sector as a multinational is probably more accurate to diversification rather than thinking about it from a country-centric thing that can get you to overthink and actually misbalance your allocation to some extent. So, so you mostly, uh, Peter, you mostly look at these big companies, I guess, huh? I think, no, what we do is we'll try to do a screen, right? So if, if it was like consumer discretionary or non-discretionary, we'll, yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll basically take all the companies within um, the MSCI World Index sector breakdown and just have an understanding on what's happening there. So in, in that case, some of them can be very big companies Unless you have like very compelling reasons on why you would want to go for, say, instead of buying like a Unilever, you'd want to buy something a lot smaller. You'd have to have some compelling reasons. So I guess the hedge fund to some extent also Im- implements rational speculation. And when you're obviously managing other people's money, you want to make sure that uh, dynamics like your probabilities, your histograms are all um, uh, conveying the same kind of message as well. Or else it becomes irrational speculation or somewhat dogmatic to some extent, right? You might have certain views about a monetary policy and how it's completely reckless. But as we've seen how commodities have done the last year or so, you know, you, you need to be objective on, on that before allocating too much of your own portfolio into a particular position. Yes. Well, at the moment... I'm not sure exactly where to go or what to do in the markets. We're in a little bit of a twilight zone Mm. because uh, we're facing something that's unique in world history where there are actual uh, bond markets, not just uh, anomalous thing. We're we're talking about uh, across the board in some countries, bonds have negative yields. I thought that was cosmically impossible. It was... It's like anti, <laughs> anti-gravity. You know, we do have a bubble today in the bond markets. Uh, they're a gigantic ap- accident that's waiting to happen. They're a triple threat to your capital. Mm. I feel pretty confident about that. I'm not sure what to think about most stock markets. At least they rec- represent equity. Right. I'm not sure what to think about most real estate markets because they rest upon uh, borrowed capital at extraordinarily low interest rates. Uh, So we really are in a twilight zone today. And uh, I really believe that um, the situation in the world is much, much more serious now than it was in 2007 uh, or 2008. And when things come undone, and I don't know when it's going to be, I'd hazard this year or next year for sure, but it could be as soon as tomorrow morning. Right. I think things are coming on good as we speak. This is going to be cataclysmic and titanic, the upset. Definitely. I, I think one way that the audience can perceive that is almost thinking about markets, like equity markets, all, all of these markets actually, as almost like a game of musical chairs. And that's what markets are, It's or hot potato. It's the last person caught standing or the last person with the potato that's going to effectively be the biggest loser. And um, as, as something goes from being private on the primary market all the way into the secondary market, all the way into the hands of the retail investor, that last guy, the guy that buys at the peak, um, it very much is like a, a game of musical chairs. And as long as you're not the last guy, 
um, there's still some um, capital gain or capital appreciation to be captured. The unfortunate thing is that equities are at all time highs, and despite whatever you know a fundamental view that you have that say would be a little bit bearish, you have to be cognizant of what. Uh, price is actually indicating, and and that's one of the things that we discuss about is how to address that from a, a rational uh, speculation perspective. Actually, well, perhaps that's one reason why I spend most of my time at this point uh, here in Argentina, and uh, to a lesser <clears throat> extent, perhaps <clears throat> in Uruguay, because these countries are um, very much out of the mainstream and perhaps they'll be somewhat insulated from the um, chaos that I see coming to the rest of the financial world in the years to come. Mm -hmm. So Doug, how are you preparing your portfolio for something like that? That's a good question. I own a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. I own cows here in Argentina, lots of cows, Mm -hmm. cattle businesses, not rewarded anybody for several generations, but I think that'll change. And in the meanwhile, uh, every other year, every mama cow has a baby cow, and every or twice a day, my milk cows, mm-hmm. you know, produce some uh, lactile liquid. So that's okay. I have a, a development here in Argentina that is, um, we have about 1,500 acres on the edge of a, a wine, little wine growing town in the middle of nowhere wow. where we can um, kind of live uh, in the lap of luxury uh, for very low costs and hopefully insulated from what's likely to go on in the rest of the world. So mm. I'm, I'm doing things of that nature. Am I doing anything in the stock market right now? Uh, the only thing that I can see as being cheap, yet it may st- stay cheap for quite a while longer, is the resource market, the mining stocks. Right. And historically, you can't really invest these things. You can only speculate uh, in them because they, um, they're all burning matches, or most of them are burning matches. I mean, so I'm, I'm doing that because a lot of them are actually selling for half of the cash they have in the bank. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty cheap. What about, uh, I know a lot of people with, with some of your views uh, would be major gold bugs to some extent. Is, is, is that, do you have a lot of precious metals or coins in your possession as well? Absolutely. I'm a big believer in gold because gold is the only financial asset that is not simultaneously somebody else's liability. Mm. And in a world where all of the currencies all of them. They're all fiat currencies. They're all IOU nothings on the part of bankrupt governments uh, and profligate central banks. Uh, yes, I think the gold is again going to be reinstituted as day to day money in the next uh, generation. So I think it's an excellent way to uh, conserve capital. So, yes, I, I'm a, a believer in uh, precious metals. So what is the most efficient way, by the way, that you hold precious metals? There's so many different ways and methodologies, and especially I'm imagining if you're in Argentina, then is is it physical, or how how, how do you do it? Well, yeah, physical. I I want coins in my possession. Mm -hmm. Uh, Your uh, your biggest risk in the markets today is a political risk. Uh, The market risks in all the markets are, are huge today. But they're dwarfed by the political risk, so you don't want all your assets in one country, certainly not the country that you carry a passport from. Right. So uh, being here in Argentina, uh, anybody with any sense, I have a lot of stuff in Argentina, Mm -hmm. but you diversify into Uruguay across the Plate River and other places. So you've got to have that political diversification. And there are things like goldmoney.com. Uh, that uh, allow you to store gold in different places around the world. Um, so sure, I, I do all kinds of things like that. Oh, that's fascinating. Do, do you also, I'd imagine you might have like a comic book collection if you're a big advocate of reading these graphic novels? Uh, no, I, I don't actually. Uh, I know that there are people that are into that. Uh, mm. I, I'm not much of a collector, uh, although I've got to say that uh, 
uh, due to the uh, trillions of currency units that, have been, that are being created all over the world by central banks, collecting has become one of the bubbles. For instance, uh, classic cars, right. musk cars. Uh, I've been into cars for many years, but I think that most of these things like uh, uh, the new Bugattis and uh, all the Ferraris and all that are going to wind up in garages with flat tires and dead batteries uh, in the next ten years, the way uh, the way happened to the their their cousins from the 1920s and 30s. By the time the 40s and 50s came, so no, I, I'm, not, I'm not a collector. I, I've, I've collected things in the past. I've collected guns. I've collected knives. I used to collect stamps, coins. Uh, but, uh, so you think that art is in, in an inflationary bubble? You know, I've been an art buyer for many years, and right. I've learned something about it. And uh, the only thing that I buy are things that I like to look at and appeal to me. I'm not interested in holding things as an asset. I mean, if, if, a, if an artist that I buy becomes somehow popular or, or shall I say, well-promoted, right. uh, then perhaps uh, the painting is worth something. Does the limited edition nature of, um, say, art's mitigate the inflationary presser of the currency that it's being valued in? Well, like I said, I, I don't treat art as an investable. I treat it as a consumer good. You know, it's, it's like houses. People have been treating houses as investments for the last 50 years. Houses right. aren't investments. They're consumer goods. They're expensive consumer goods. And uh, they're not actually assets. They're liabilities because That's they cost a- you money every year. That's from Rich Dad huh? Poor Dad, isn't it? That that concept that the ha- your house is a liability, a, not an asset. Yes, and it's an excellent concept that Kiyosaki's come up with. Sure, it's it's not. I don't know if it's original or unique, but absolutely correct. And uh, people are looking at them from uh, uh, through the wrong end of the telescope. Certainly today, certainly today, when when houses are very overpriced and where uh, real estate taxes on houses are immense. So, no, uh, people forget about the, uh, uh, the taxes and they forget about the utilities and they forget about the maintenance uh, and they forget about the fact that real estate's an illiquid market. So, no, you should treat your house as a consumer good. And I've been saying this for decades. This isn't, any, this isn't a, a new cosmic breakthrough. Doug, isn't that view that your house is an asset, isn't that popularized by banks because they're willing to collateralize it more than any other asset, actually? Yes, of course. And, and you shouldn't have a mortgage against your house. Everybody does. And it, it, maybe it's intelligent. I think it is today. In today's world, it's intelligent to have a mortgage against your house because if you can borrow money at 3 or 4 or 5%, whatever it is, that, that liability, which is your mortgage, is actually going to become an asset as it's inflated out of existence right. uh, by the government. So. Everything is topsy-turvy. Everything is upside down in today's world. But uh, people forget that it was only up until the 1930s that uh, few people had mortgages on their houses. They, they bought their houses when they could afford them. Right. In other words, when they had the cash. That's not how you know if you can afford something, if you can buy it for cash. If you have to borrow, you actually can't afford it. And you're speculating in something without even knowing you're speculating in it. I mean, this is one of many reasons I expect that, uh, you know, most people are going to uh, be very unpleasantly surprised in the years to come. Going back to our um, conversation earlier about illusions, one of the great, I guess, marketing slogans that many people don't know about is the American dream and how it's actually originated through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, equivalent to like a Nike just do it, basically, that has become an idea that the American dream consists of owning your own house and using those services as a form of um, mortgage to do so, actually. Well, look, it's a consumer good. Yeah. So uh, you shouldn't be financing your house any more than you should be financing your car. This is another thing I'll point out. It used to be people paid cash for their cars right. because they knew they could afford something. And then it was a two-year financing for your car, and then it went to three-year financing, and now it's up to seven years. And most people don't even finance it. They lease the car. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, it's uh, it, it's insane. What's the next thing? They're going to do this for the clothes on their backs. People are being gradually transformed into uh, into serfs, where they, where they can't, they have no flexibility. Uh, they can't move uh, be, because they're burdened by all this debt. And of course, not the least uh, uh, of these things is uh, student debt, which is completely insane. Why don't you elaborate a little bit more on that and what you think the, are the implications are for, for this student debt? Well, of course, most of as, as we talked about earlier, I, I counsel kids in high school to do something more intelligent with uh, those four valuable years of their lives and the immense amount of money it takes to, uh, to go to uh, an institution to be programmed. But, um, I mean, that's... That's my view on it. It's just people go to college because they think it's going to teach them how to think. It's ridiculous. Uh, if they knew how to think before they went to college, they wouldn't go to college to start with. <laughs> What's very interesting, actually, is that it, it seems to be like a, a growing sample of many of the true innovators within society are the ones that have no expertise in the field that they were actually originally in. Uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, self, all pretty much self-taught and, and just bringing in almost a different equation, um, becoming game changers within their own industry. Exactly. And these are three excellent and recent examples of uh, people that were smart enough to see that they didn't need to misallocate time and money uh, on the educational treadmill uh, in an officially approved institution. I don't even know. I don't even know if Richard Branson uh, went to college. Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think so. I'm not sure I, about that one. That's a good question. I know that Bill Gates recently received an honorary degree by Cambridge. Actually, so there you go. It, eventually, you'll get it if you create enough value within society. Someone will want to honor you in that shape or form if you choose to accept that or not. Yeah, well, I'd, if they gave me one, I'd say thank you very much, and I'd give the assembled students a lecture on why they're idiots for sitting in the audience getting diplomas the <laughs> themselves. <laughs> Doug, we also found out that you're, I think you're calling for a financial crisis this year. I know you mentioned it earlier, but is it 2015 that you think will be a financial crisis? I've been expecting things to fall apart again since about 2012, and it's lasted longer than I expected, the artificial good times. So, uh, I don't know if it'll be this year or next year because I don't have a crystal ball. Right. But I do know that in the real world, action has consequences, cause has effect, yeah. and it's it's going to be very ugly what's going on. And I mean, for instance, I, I look forward to the collapse of the U.S. government and many other governments, but right. I don't say that lightly because in 1789 I would look would have looked forward the collapse of the French government. Right. But things got worse then with Robespierre and then Napoleon. Yes. And if I'd lived in uh, Russia in 1917, I would have looked forward to the collapse of the, the Tsar's government. But then things got worse with one and then with Alan. So it's not going to be pleasant. I, I had a chance to discuss with Jim Rogers. He's gracious enough to um, invite us over to his house in Singapore and we discuss about that very concept, um, the, the changing of the guard. And, you know, I'd imagine you're probably in the same camp that you're going to see the U.S. being surpassed someday. And I asked him, obviously, who would be a great successor to that or who's in a position to be the successor of that. And he obviously China was brought up. But is China the kind of successor that the world would, um, need at that time. Uh, we, I, we discuss about the fall of the Roman Empire and how basically barbarians were at the gate um, as, as a potential successor as well. So what are your thoughts on, on China and, and their role? And do you think that they, they would be making the right kind of, um, I guess, superpower within the world? Well, the first thing about China is I hope that it breaks up into at least five or six or ten different 
countries. Mm-hmm. I mean, because as, as you're aware, I mean, not everybody in China, well, maybe everybody does now, but the mother language of perhaps most people in China isn't Mandarin Chinese, and there are many different areas of China and cultures. So I hope it breaks up into several different countries right. so, it doesn't have, so it doesn't run the risk of uh, becoming an empire. In fact, I hope that uh, the area of North America known currently as the United States breaks up into at least six or seven different countries. And mm-hmm. I think it'll happen, actually. I think it's in course. In, in, in fact, it's happening now, even in the United States. Uh, the uh, Hispanic people talk about the Reconquista, right. of the land that the uh, Anglos uh, stole from their culture back in the middle of the uh, 19th century. Right. And they're taking it back demographically. So I don't think China is going to survive as an entity. And I don't think the U.S. will either. And good riddance to both. Doug, isn't, objectively speaking, isn't the, the paradigm right now more about um, globalization and, like, the merging of countries rather than the, the recognition of individual sovereignty uh, or for, for state or province? I, I, I think that's more of the, the trend, isn't it? Like, trilateral agreements, um, NAFTA, uh, the European Union, which is struggling. Um, no, no, I, I, no I, I disagree. Look. All these, all these governments <clears throat> always form clubs, for, like the United Nations and NATO and the IMF. And these things are corrupt and counterproductive, and they're all going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look forward to the bankruptcy and the disappearance of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, among other things. And I think the European Union is going to collapse, and, and certainly the euro uh, might be the first, I don't know if it'll be the yen or the euro, will be the first uh, uh, currency that's going to fall apart. The euro was always an Esperanto currency anyway, uh, a Frankenstein currency assembled out of ridiculous parts. <laughs> so, uh, and when you look at Europe, uh, you've got the, the Basques want to separate and uh, Catalonia wants to separate from Spain uh, what happened in Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. I think, is the wave of the future. I think that uh, Russia is going to have more things uh, spinning off from it in the future. Uh, what's happening in the Ukraine today, where it's being divided into uh, uh, the Donetsk region and, and, and uh, the, you know, the part run by Kiev. I mean, right. this is the way things are going. At the same time, these governments are... are are grabbing the world in a stranglehold. Uh, All over the world, they're becoming more dominant, more repressive. So you've got two trends that are fighting against each other. And I certainly hope that the separatist separatist trend is the one that that succeeds and and, and rules in the future. Well, Doug, we've covered so many different subjects, and I think one of the best ways to end this is... um our favorite gimmick, which is the word association game. So I'm going to say a word. Um, you tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Now, I'll, I'll mind you that um, the record for that has been a multi-sentence answer, um, but we want to try to keep it down just to one word. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Quantitative easing. Idiocy. Doomed to failure. Oil. Mm. Currently very necessary. Okay. Don't know where the price is going. Oh, that that definitely was a sentence. <laughs> Platinum. Gold is better. That's a phrase. Well, that is a short sentence. Mm-hmm. The best investment. Best investment. Doesn't exist. War. Coming. Currency war. We have it now. Theology. Uh, ridiculous. Oh my. <laughs> Economic prosperity. Hopefully in a generation. Hmm. Success. A personal thing. This conversation. A great pleasure, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for coming on the show. 
We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.